the salient points of Republic Act No. 11,313 or the Safe Spaces Act. This law addresses sexual harassment, specifically gender-based sexual harassment. Sexual harassment in general is any form of unwanted verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature deployed with the purpose or effect of violating the dignity of a person when creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment. Going back to the Safe Spaces Act, what does the law aim to achieve? The law was enacted to uphold the equality of men and women and afford them their safe spaces. What is the import of the Safe Spaces Act? In one case, the Supreme Court stated that the Safe Spaces Act expands on the concept of discrimination and protects persons of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, and or expression. It thus recognizes gender-based sexual harassment as including, among others, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, and sexist slurs. The law defines gender as a set of socially ascribed characteristics, norms, roles, attitudes, values, and expectations identifying the social behavior of men and women and the relations between them. The concept of gender, identity, and or expression, in turn, refers to the personal sense of identity as characterized, among others, by the manner of clothing, inclinations, and behavior in relation to masculine or feminine conventions. Just to provide context, there's another law related to our topic that's worthy of mention. It's the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995, or Republic Act No. 7877. In this law, sexual harassment is defined as the act of demanding or requesting sexual favor by a person having authority or moral ascendancy over another, regardless of whether the demand or request is accepted or not. What is the nature of sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995? Sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995 is not about a man taking advantage of a woman because of sexual desire. It is about power being exercised by a superior officer over his subordinates. The power emanates from the fact that the superior can remove the subordinate from his workplace if the latter would refuse his amorous advances. The gravamen of the offense in sexual harassment is not the violation of the employee's sexuality, but the abuse of power by the employer. Jurisprudence mentions that sexual harassment is an imposition of misplaced superiority. Therefore, sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995 can be committed only when there is a superior-subordinate relationship. Where can sexual harassment be committed under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995? Sexual harassment can be committed, number one, in an education or training environment, or number two, in a work-related or employment environment. In an education or training environment, sexual harassment is committed, number one, when sexual favor is made as a condition for giving a passing grade, granting of honors and scholarships, payment of benefits, privileges, or considerations, or, number two, when sexual advances result in intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the trainee or apprentice. In an education or training environment, the victim can be a person who is under the care, custody, or supervision of the offender, or a person whose education or training is entrusted to the offender. In a work-related environment, sexual harassment is committed. Number one, when sexual favor is made as a condition for hiring, re-employment, or continued employment of an employee or for granting favorable terms, conditions, or privileges. Number two, when sexual advances impair the employee's rights or privileges or result in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the employee. Or number three, when refusal to grant the sexual favor results in discrimination, deprivation, or diminution of employment opportunities, or otherwise adversely affect said employee. In a work-related or employment environment, the victim can be an employee or an applicant for employment. Jurisprudence teaches that the Safe Spaces Act does not undo or abandon the definition of sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. The gravamen of the offenses punished under the Safe Spaces Act is the act of sexually harassing a person on the basis of his or her sexual orientation gender identity, and or expression. By contrast, the offense punished under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995 relates to abuse of one's authority, influence, or moral ascendancy 
so as to enable the sexual harassment of a subordinate. One may ask, if there is a law penalizing sexual harassment, why was a new law needed? This is because other aspects of sexual harassment are not covered by the concept of sexual harassment under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. What if the instances of harassment occurred between peers in schools or in the workplace? What if harassment happened in the streets and public places? What if harassment was experienced online? These are not considered as crimes under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995. Hence, the need for a law granting us safe spaces, which contemplate public spaces, online platforms, as well as workplaces and educational or training institutions where persons are supposed to be protected from gender-based sexual harassment. The Safe Spaces Act took effect on August 3, 2019. What is gender-based sexual harassment? It refers to conduct that causes or is likely to cause mental, emotional, or psychological distress to a person on the basis of gender, gender identity, and or expression. In what spaces are gender-based sexual harassment criminalized? Number one, public spaces. Number two, online. Number three, workplaces. Or number four, educational and training institutions. Gender-based sexual harassment in public places. This refers to the following unwanted and uninvited sexual actions or remarks done in public spaces against the recipient. Number one, catcalling, or the unwanted remarks towards a person in the form of wolf whistling, unwanted invitations, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, and sexist slurs. Number two, persistent uninvited comments or gestures on the recipient's appearance. Number three, Relentless requests for the recipient's personal details. Number four, statement of sexual comments and suggestions. Number five, public masturbation or flashing of private parts, grouping, making offensive body gestures at the recipient, and other similar lewd sexual actions. Number six, unwanted advances, which include cursing, leering, and intrusive gazing, taunting, and those that threaten the recipient's sense of personal space and physical safety. Number seven, persistent cracking of sexual jokes, use of sexual names, or number eight, stalking, which refers to conduct directed at a person involving the repeated visual or physical proximity, non-consensual communication, or a combination thereof that cause or will likely cause a person to fear for one's own safety or the safety of others or to suffer emotional distress. For context, public spaces refer to streets and alleys, public parks, schools, buildings, malls, bars, restaurants, transportation terminals, public markets, spaces used as evacuation centers, government offices, public utility vehicles as well as private vehicles covered by app-based transport network services, and other recreational spaces such as, but not limited to, cinema halls, theaters, and spas. Gender-based online sexual harassment. This refers to the following distressing, terrorizing, or intimidating conduct manifested against the recipient on online platforms or those which use information and communications technology. Number one, physical, psychological, and emotional threats, as well as unwanted sexual misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic, and sexist remarks and comments posted publicly or sent through direct and private messages. Number two, invasion of the recipient's privacy through cyberstalking and incessant messaging. Number three, uploading and sharing of photos, voice, videos, or media with sexual content without the recipient's consent. Number four, unauthorized recording and sharing of recipient's photos, videos, or information. Number five, impersonating the recipient's identity or posting lies about the recipient to harm his or her reputation. Or number six, filing false abuse reports to platforms to silence the recipients. Gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace and in educational or training environments. This involves the following acts. Number one, unwelcome sexual advances, requests, or demand for sexual favors, or any act of sexual nature that has or could have detrimental effect on the conditions of an individual's employment or education, job performance, or opportunities. Number two, unwelcome 
unreasonable and offensive conduct of sexual nature and other conduct based on sex affecting the dignity of a person. Number three, unwelcome conduct that is pervasive and creates an intimidating, hostile, or humiliating environment for the recipient. These acts may be done verbally, physically, or through the use of technology such as text messaging or electronic mail, or through any other forms of information and communication systems. Who may be liable? Any person who commits an act of gender-based sexual harassment may be held liable under the Safe Spaces Act. Unlike the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act of 1995, the Safe Spaces Act does not require the existence of a superior or subordinate relationship for gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace. Neither does the Safe Spaces Act require the presence of a teacher-student or trainer-trainee relationship for gender-based sexual harassment in educational or training environments. The Safe Spaces Act provides that gender-based sexual harassment may be committed even between peers and those committed to a superior officer by a subordinate or to a teacher by a student or to a trainer by a trainee. Note the obligations with regard to gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces. Privately owned places that are open to the public shall adopt a zero-tolerance policy against gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces and provide a safe, gender-sensitive environment to encourage victims to report gender-based sexual harassment at the first instance. These establishments shall immediately coordinate with the local police authorities when an incident of gender-based sexual harassment is reported to them. Said establishments shall also make closed-circuit television footage available when ordered by the court. Furthermore, these establishments shall post clearly visible warning signs against gender-based public spaces sexual harassment, including the anti-sexual harassment hotline number, in bold letters, and shall designate at least one anti-sexual harassment officer to receive gender-based sexual harassment complaints. Deputized security guards within such establishments shall apprehend perpetrators caught in flagrante delicto and shall immediately coordinate with local authorities. Local government units shall enforce the provisions against gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces, receive and process complaints, and set up closed-circuit televisions in major roads, alleys, and sidewalks in their respective areas to aid in the filing of cases and gathering of evidence. The Metro Manila Development Authority, the local units of the Philippine National Police for other provinces, and the Women and Children's Protection Desk of the Philippine National Police shall apprehend violators of the provisions against gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces. The Department of the Interior and Local Government, Department of Social Welfare and Development, in coordination with the Department of Health and the Philippine Commission on Women, shall ensure that victims of gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces are provided the proper psychological counseling support services. Take note, the violator shall bear the fees of psychological counseling services availed by the victim. Note the obligations with regard to gender-based online sexual harassment. The Anti-Cyber Crime Group of the Philippine National Police shall develop a real-time online reporting mechanism, receive complaints, and apprehend perpetrators relating to acts of gender-based online sexual harassment. Note the obligations with regard to gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace and in educational or training institutions. In essence, this is to prevent, deter, and penalize commission of gender-based sexual harassment. In particular, employers and heads of educational or training institutions are mandated to a. Disseminate a copy of the Safe Spaces Act to all persons in the workplace or post the same in a conspicuous place within the workplace. Letter B. Provide measures to prevent gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace, such as the conduct of anti-sexual harassment seminars. Letter C. Create a committee on decorum and investigation to investigate and address complaints of gender-based sexual harassment. Letter D. Adopt, publish, and disseminate a code of conduct or policy against gender-based sexual harassment, which includes, among others, certain mechanisms such as assigning an office or person that must be readily accessible to receive complaints on gender-based sexual harassment and facilitating the filing of complaints. Letter E, support relevant persons when a case of gender-based sexual harassment reaches the courts 
such as excusing students' absences from classes when they need to attend court hearings. The Committee on Decorum and Investigation is required to Letter A. Adequately represent management, employees from the supervisory rank, rank and file employees, union, school administration, trainers, instructors, professors or coaches, and students or trainees, students and parents as the case may be. Letter B. Designate a woman as its head and make certain that not less than half of its members should be women. Furthermore, the Committee on Decorum and Investigation of Educational and Training Institutions should ensure equal representation of persons of diverse sexual orientation, identity, and or expression as far as practicable. Letter C. Be composed of members who should be impartial and not connected or related to the alleged perpetrator. Letter D. Investigate and decide on complaints within 10 days or less upon receipt thereof. Letter E. Observe due process. Letter F. Protect the complainant from retaliation. And letter G. Guarantee confidentiality to the greatest extent possible. Employees and co-workers shall have the duty to Letter A. Refrain from committing acts of gender-based sexual harassment. Letter B. Discourage the conduct of gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace. Letter C. Provide emotional or social support to fellow employees, co-workers, colleagues, and peers who are victims of gender-based sexual harassment. And letter D. Report acts of gender-based sexual harassment witnessed in the workplace. Who can report instances of gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace? Any person can report to the employer or any agent of the employer instances of gender-based sexual harassment. Of course, the employee can report directly to the Committee on Decorum and Investigation and the guidelines and procedures of the latter shall be observed. The employee may also file a report anonymously, but take note that it shall not constitute a formal complaint unless made by the victim in his or her own name. At any rate, such report shall constitute sufficient notice to the employer who shall thereafter verify and refer the matter to the Committee on Decorum and Investigation. Note the penalties for violation of the law. A violation of the provisions of the Safe Spaces Act is penalized as follows. Persons are judged to have violated the provisions of gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces under Section 11A. Number 1. The first offense shall be punished by a fine of 1,000 pesos and community service of 12 hours, inclusive of attendance to a gender sensitivity seminar to be conducted by the Philippine National Police in coordination with the concerned local government unit and the Philippine Commission on Women. Number two, the second offense shall be punished by arresto menor, or 6 to 10 days, or a fine of 3,000 pesos. Number three, the third offense shall be punished by arresto menor for 11 to 30 days and a fine of 10,000 pesos. Section 11b. Number 1. The first offense shall be punished by a fine of 10,000 pesos and community service of 12 hours inclusive of attendance to a gender sensitivity seminar to be conducted by the Philippine National Police in coordination with the concerned local government unit and the Philippine Commission on Women. Number 2. The second offense shall be punished by arresto menor or 11 to 30 days or a fine of 15,000 pesos. Number 3. The third offense shall be punished by arresto mayor or 1 month and 1 day to 6 months and a fine of 20,000 pesos. Section 11C. Number 1. The first offense shall be punished by arresto menor or 11 to 30 days or a fine of 30,000 pesos provided that it includes attendance in a gender sensitivity seminar to be conducted by the Philippine National Police in coordination with the concerned local government unit and the Philippine Commission on Women. Number two, the second offense shall be punished by arresto mayor or one month and one day to six months or a fine of 50,000 pesos. Number three, the third offense shall be punished by arresto mayor in its maximum period or a fine of 100,000 pesos. Operators of public utility vehicles who are found to have committed gender-based sexual harassment. Number one, cancellation of license by the Land Transportation Office. And number two, 
suspension or revocation of franchise by the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board. Minors found to have committed gender-based sexual harassment. Disciplinary measures as provided for in the Juvenile Justice and Welfare Act of 2006. Persons are judged to have violated the provisions on gender-based online sexual harassment. Prison correctional in its medium period or a fine of not less than 100,000 pesos but not more than 500,000 pesos or both at the discretion of the court. A juridical person adjudged to have violated the provisions on gender-based online sexual harassment, revocation of license or franchise. An alien adjudged to have violated the provisions of gender-based online sexual harassment, deportation after service of sentence and fine. Employers who fail to comply with their duties under Section 17 of the Safe Spaces Act. A fine of not less than 5,000 pesos nor more than 10,000 pesos. Employers who fail to take action on reported acts of gender-based sexual harassment. Fine of not less than 10,000 pesos nor more than 15,000 pesos. Heads of educational or training institutions who fail to comply with their duties under Section 22 of the Safe Spaces Act. Fine of not less than 5,000 pesos nor more than 10,000 pesos. Persons found to have committed gender-based sexual harassment in educational institutions, stripping of diploma or expulsion. Minor students found to have committed gender-based sexual harassment Administrative sanctions prescribed by the school handbook. Note the aggravating circumstances for gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces or gender-based online sexual harassment. The Safe Spaces Act imposes a penalty next higher in degree in the following cases. Number one, if the act takes place in a common carrier or public utility vehicle, including but not limited to jeepneys, taxis, tricycles, or app-based transport network vehicle services where the perpetrator is the driver of the vehicle and the offended party is a passenger. Number two, if the offended party is a minor, a senior citizen, or a person with disability, or a breastfeeding mother nursing her child. Number three, if the offended party is diagnosed with a mental problem tending to impair consent. Number four, if the perpetrator is a member of the uniformed services, such as the Philippine National Police and the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and the act was perpetrated while the perpetrator was in uniform. And number five, if the act takes place in the premises of a government agency offering frontline services to the public, and the perpetrator is a government employee. Note the prescriptive periods. Any action arising from the violation of any of the provisions of the Safe Spaces Act shall prescribe as follows. Violations of the provisions on gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces under 11A of the Safe Spaces Act. It's one year. Violations of the provisions of gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces under Section 11B. It's three years. Violations of the provisions on gender-based sexual harassment in public spaces under Section 11C of the Safe Spaces Act. It's 10 years. Violations of the provisions on gender-based online sexual harassment. This is imprescriptible. Violations of the provisions of gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace and in educational or training institutions. It's 5 years. Finally, the victim of work-related or education or training-related gender-based sexual harassment may institute a separate and independent action for damages and other affirmative relief.